So, in other words, if we look at the mechanisms via which the exercise is able to exert its effects on brain injury, then there is, first of all, the whole issue of which brain regions are affected. We know all too little. We have the issue of early versus late. There seems to be some indications that late might be more beneficial, but then again, a huge but. Uh, we have some indications that stress might be negative and forced might be uh, not the ideal situation, but etc. So what we need to tease out is a lot more about the detailed mechanisms and also maybe not to be as general as we are talking about brain injury and rehabilitation of brain injury. I'm not going to spend uh, more than a few minutes, but just to indicate a little bit of what we know by now of the reorganization of the injured brain. Things aren't all that simple. Uh, there are, if we look at what we see after a post-traumatic recovery, we see that various structures are involved in the recovery, but the pattern of structures of which are now upgraded and downgraded in the solution of a particular task, these are task dependent. So in other words, we cannot say that if you get a hippocampal lesion, which part of the brain is it that takes over? Now, first of all, the word take over is actually wrong because the part of the brain that in a particular situation takes over is still processing the same type of information uh, the way it did. However, it is participating now in a new context. So you do not create a model of what you used, but you reorganize in a task-specific manner. So it is not as simple, I just want to give you here an illustration of a model I illustrating, and again, I would spend all afternoon if I were to go into the details, but in general, there is a reorganization of the, of the participation of uh, various brain structures, and this is something task-specific. So it might be that when we, for instance, use a model of hippocampal damage, we might get different answers to the uh, question of is forced or voluntary uh, exercise beneficial depending on what kind of task we are using. The kind of reorganization depends on this feedback you're getting while training a specific task. This, by the way, have some rather important clinical implications. Uh, there was some talking uh, in the context of the previous talk about how much would a training generalize. And one of the things is that when you work on a particular task in brain injured patients, you should not necessarily expect that reorganization to generalize to other tasks or, for that matter, other situations. So what we know about the reorganization of the brain is that you should train in situations as close to those situations in which you're actually eventually expecting the patient to use this information. So you could have the rather tragic situation of a patient doing very well in the clinic uh, or in the hospital and then uh, upon leaving the hospital or clinic actually uh, failing in tasks that he or she managed to do quite well under one set of circumstances but not being able to do so under other circumstances. Now that's something maybe only indirectly relevant to what I've been talking about, but still, it might be relevant when it comes to the issue of which part of the brain is it you want to promote plasticity within. And it might be that for certain tasks, for certain situations, certain parts of the brain would actually be in a better situation after a stressful event. Look at the changes of BDNF under stress in the prefrontal regions. This might be beneficial in some instances, but not in others. So when using the animal models, we need to go for a much more detailed analysis across types. Uh, we have a reorganization of the preserved parts of the brain, and we need to address this in much more detail. And of course, when using it, um, in clinics, we also need to take into account that it might not be just a beneficial method. Now, this is again, I said, the side effects of this should be very few. True, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't be negative effects in certain instances of boosting survivability and plasticity. Last issue, could there be synergies with other methods? 
What other methods could we use? Well, we certainly have looked for synergies with the uh, new psychological rehabilitation, with the training programs. Uh, that's what we've been looking at primarily besides the new chemical data. However, we also by now have some good results regarding pharmacologically supported rehabilitation. Uh, here we have again animals. The black dot indicates control animals. Here we have hippocampal lesioned animals, the red one. But the green ones are groups of animals with the same lesion as the red ones, same magnitude, it's a hippocampal lesion, and a very significantly improved uh, performance. These got one dosage of a drug which you all know. And um, I'm going just to show you the first paper showing it. Erythropoietin is that drug, is that drug. Now, some of you might say you do not know it. However, if you abbreviate erythropoietin into EPO, I think everybody uh, should, especially since Tour de France just came to an end, uh, be able to remember what EPO is. EPO is a hormone, and EPO is a hormone uh, which we have known and used uh, pharmacologically for years and years to support the production of erythrocytes, the red blood cells. However, we have known now for some 10 to 15 years that there is a separate production of EPO in the brain where it has a significant new protective effect. There are separate receptors for EPO, etc. So maybe one could imagine, for instance, combining EPO and exercise. Would it make sense? Well, actually it would, because we know that EPO is likely to exert at least some of its new protective effort, effects via boosting the production of BDNF. So maybe an interaction between these two therapeutic methods might be useful. And an indication that there are interactions in just EPO, I can show you here. Two experiments. These are the controls. These are those lesions. And these are the ones getting EPO. And as you can see here in this experiment, EPO is practically eliminating the consequences of lesions. Here, it's got a significant, but not as pronounced effect. The difference is that in this case, the distance from the application of EPO and lesion, in both instances, EPO was given at the moment of lesion. The distance from that and up to the start of training was one week. So these had their lesions and EPO, waited for a week and started training. These had their EPO and lesion, waited for a month, and started training. So the consequences of EPO seems to depend in some kind of interaction on the distance to when training begins. Please notice this is not the issue of early training versus late training because the training effects are actually kind of the same, but the effect of EPO per se interacts with the training. These kind of interactions tells us that again, we need to be a lot more aware of various synergistic or, for that matter, non-synergistic, but just interactive effects. And maybe there could be some with exercise. We haven't got managed to get around to uh, working with this yet, but these are, after all, interactions. There could be other methods. It's a maybe. Uh, only time will tell. We'll have to wait at least more than a couple of weeks to give you those answers. Uh, maybe next year, who knows. Um, but anyway, just since one of the topics of this is actually nutrition. I just want to give you a little bit of food for thought here. Here we have animals on a standard diet, those that are passive and those that exercise. And by now you know the results, BDNF is boosted. But please notice these. These are animals living under the same condition as these, just with one difference. They are on a high fat diet. So now you have come from the lunch and uh, you have done whatever crimes you committed. Uh, but I can tell you that if you had a high fat intake, you have contributed to having a lower BDNF level. And if you exercise, the good news is you can actually, to an extent, get your BDNF levels back towards normal. However, you do not reach the level that you did if you had a low-fat diet and exercised. So uh, that was, pardon? What kind of fat? What? 
Uh, this was a combination. They weren't all that specific. Um, in, in a nutritional context, it would have been nice uh, to have done a little bit more detailed studies. So, uh, but anyway, um, this is just another reminder uh, that some of the topics for the rest of the course uh, actually also have a little bit to do with BDNF. In short, there's no doubt that exercising your brains uh, is actually a good idea in general. But should it be forced? Should it be voluntary? When should it be done? Well, there are lots of open questions. That's, by the way, also another open question. Um, I've been wondering throughout Tour de France, why do they use uh, bicycle helmets? Uh, they are pumped with EPO. They are highly trained. Uh, what are they actually afraid of? Um, that one should not be taken all too seriously. Um, so we do have hopes and challenges. It is a very dynamic brain, for better or worse. But what we are trying to do is do something to perfect to a dynamic structure that is self-reorganizing constantly. Your brain is different when you leave today as opposed to what it was when you arrived. Uh, your brains, in case you ever get brain injury, are going to go into a radical reorganization on their own. Forget about retraining, forget about all therapeutic interventions. The brain itself is starting to reorganize. In this reorganizational process, we are trying to do something specific relative to the training of various cognitive faculties, motoric abilities, uh, central processing, etc. But we're also trying to then inflict something kind of general, which we believe to be general, which seems to be wrong, with medication, EPO, etc., with exercise. That seems also to have differential effects, depending on how much stress, what kind of stress, when is the stress, etc. There is a lot to be learned. Uh, usually, ask a scientist and you get 10 questions back instead of the one answer you would have liked. Uh, I'm not sure whether I gave you 10 more uh, questions, but at least I can tell you, yes, exercise does play a role. There's a good reason to use it clinically, but there's an even better reason to learn a lot more in order to use it. So, thank you very much. Um, I uh, feel bad about you sitting down so long, but still. <laughs>